So welcome to the Neuralace podcast. The Neuralace podcast is all about neurophysics, which is the science and technology behind Neuralace. Neurophysics is an umbrella topic that includes spatial computing, which is the technology behind virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality. It's also an umbrella topic that includes deep learning artificial intelligence. Some of the topics that come up in this podcast will be about computer vision specifically, about um, applying deep learning to medical imaging. Uh, it's the first podcast that will attempt to unite uh, the topics of web VR with Neuralace and quantum mechanics. It's um, the, it's the podcast that dares to ask how information in the networks of the brain are organized and how we might query that information in any region of the brain with a brain port that understands the transmission protocol of the brain. I'm going to propose uh, that transmission protocol on this podcast. And we also talk about hacking into the brain's VR system to add things to your reality that are not really there. And we, and I actually um, attempt to explain how we could do that in this first episode. And then we also chat about, um, in, in the course of this podcast, talking about the kinds of things we can download, information from the brain, like holograms of your experiences, um, as if your eyes became cameras, so we can capture what you saw and what you heard, and you can share those experiences with others. Um, you could share those experiences in court. We also talk about defending our brains against remote hacks, and we boldly we dare to boldly go where no one has gone before. So welcome very much to the Neuralace podcast. Um, your host is Michael Bloomberg. The podcast is edited by Adam Alonzi. And today's guest on the episode one, Democratizing Neuralace, is Shannon Narao, who is an ARVR enthusiast. Shannon is also um, part of the Kronos group developing OpenXR. And I wanted to talk to Shannon um, in part because he's connected to WebVR and WebGL, but also because um, I'm interested in it creating an open standard for Neuralace so the world can have it. And that's why I'm giving it away on this podcast. In future episodes of this podcast, we'll be talking to uh, neuroscientists and we'll be talking to computer scientists and we'll be talking to executives at uh, major tech companies Companies that are making EEG product, products or AI products or new kinds of web browsers or just new kinds of um, technology, period. People who are uh, working on um, converging technologies like applying deep learning to, um, to all sorts of imaging, not just medical imaging. Um, and so there's so much uh, technology that's converging and it's going to result in, in uh, amazing forward progress in terms of uh, technology and science and so the social good that can be achieved. So welcome to the Neuralace podcast. I hope you enjoy it. So let's go ahead and get started. So Shannon, um, let's uh, explain to people maybe what Neuralace is. And, and at the root of it, um, you could say, let's describe that it's an advanced form of just uh, brain computer interface. Hey, yeah. Uh, hey, thanks for having me. Um, all right. So, yeah, my name is uh, Shannon Norell, and uh, I'm a passionate, uh, I guess, VR, AR evangelist type person. Kind of been here for the ride for the last five years or so, and uh, bringing it to the next evolutionary step, which is past AR, which is going to be. Uh, neural lace and well you could almost say neural lace is going to become factored into vr and ar as we know it neural lace being a brain to computer interface so um we are talking about um we have the, there's a lot of great ideas on how to achieve neural lace and a lot of people want to keep their ideas a secret and so we were talking about that in terms of if we give away how to make neural lace on this podcast um, what is our objective then? And should Neuralace be democratized so every company can know how to do it? And, and my thought there is that we should democratize Neuralace because we really want this technology to exist in the world and we do not necessarily know because um, it's, it's a very complex thing that uh, to try to solve. And so we, we want to encourage as many people 
to get on board with um, helping us to create neurolace as possible so that we can have neurolace in our lifetimes. Absolutely agree. And uh, there, everyone in the space, so far as I've seen it, are, are very protective of their algorithms, their techniques. I mean, talking about it openly, it seems to be like, uh, you know, protecting their IP. They're squatting on domains already. Uh, you know, it's kind of uh, it's kind of ridiculous because it is a difficult problem. It's it's a problem that when solved will affect all of humanity. So why shouldn't we all share it? And uh, I think having an open source uh, will be useful and required really to make it happen because if we have secret algorithms that are operating, we don't know how, what's going on in the background, that's going to slow the adoption rate of neural lace. People will be suspicious of it, things like that. So I think, you know, if we create some kind of a open source standard or groups that uh, will we'll work together to make this thing happen, I, I think it's a good I think it's a good move. So someone remarked to me recently that in order to achieve um, the, the kind of neuralist we're talking about, or brain-to-computer interface we're talking about, you'd have to have a number of like Nobel Prize winning discoveries that would happen pretty much simultaneously. Um, and the, and so one of the positive outcomes that um, of neuralist is, is we'll be able to do, um, it, it's on the way to discovering it, we're going to have to revolutionize medical um, neuroscience. And that, that means, for example, um, we're going to have to figure out the um, transmission. Let, let's, let's say that the, the brain is, is organized like um, the brain and the nervous system are organized like the Internet, for example, as many neuroscientists believe. Um, we're going to have to figure out what the um, transmission protocol of the brain is. And if we do that, um, you know, from neuron to neuron, if we do that, that's going to enable the kinds of products like, um, like artificial limbs that can connect to your nervous system or reconnecting the spine. Um, it's not necessarily um, as glamorous as the science fiction con- concept of neural lace, but there's a lot of pre- practical medical applications to being able to connect a, a limb or reconnect a spine, um, an artificial limb to your nervous system. So you can um, really uh, e- e- even, and even create new kinds of limbs. Um, so these are um, really positive outcomes that can come from pursuing a direction of research towards neural lace. Well, I, let me let me just back up and say uh, kind of some points I wanted to cover. So solving, quote, neural lace, brain-computer interface, it, it is a difficult task. But, yes, it, it's something that needs to not be overthought too much. There are certain baby steps we can take along the way that are low-hanging fruit that are easily solvable now, okay? The the first path, so I'm, I'm sitting here, I'm looking at an emotive uh, headset. If you guys aren't familiar with that, it has, uh, I think it has six EEGs on it. Uh, they have one model that has six, another one has 14. Um, and what that does is it pulls in brain waves from different regions of your brain. Okay. Now there's a, there's a, a section called the homunculus. It's kind of an idealized section of the brain. It's not really a specific region, but it's a, it's an idealized version, region of the brain that will, indicate things like um, facial expression. It'll indicate uh, like eye blinks. It'll indicate, uh, I think, body posture, hand position, if we are able to accurately read these areas of the brain. So these emotive devices are, are really quite primitive now. I mean, they're, they're um, the, the, the six sensor, one, two, three, four, five, six sensor one, effectively reads um, skin tension uh, and, and small motors up in the forehead and can infer things like, uh, like eye blink, stuff like that. So my, my first, my, sort of my first baby step I want to I accomplish is to use a, an EEG headset, ne- Neural Lace Alpha 0.1, <laughs> to solve the problem of not having a face in VR. So when you're, when you're in virtual reality, you don't really have, you know, your eyes are covered. You can't, when you're looking at someone else in a, another virtual world, you can't tell if their eyes are blinking. You can't see if their mouth is moving. Uh, I, I think that these, that particular problem is solvable in the, in the short run. Okay, so sort of reading facial expressions. I'd like to solve that first. The next step would be to get more involved and get actual 
body position and arm position, finger position by reading these sections of the brain. Now, how do we read these sections of brain of the brain when you know everyone's brain is different and the placement of the EEGs may be different each time? So th- these are definitely problems we have to solve. We have to solve. So so at present, what what we have, and I've seen this in action, is is a way of sort of recording brainwave states um, and inferring meaning from that. So, for instance, let's say you put on a headset, you're in a blank, completely blank room, and I put an apple in the middle of the floor. So all you can see is an apple. And then I record your brainwave state as you focus on this apple. Okay? Okay, next. Stop record. So we have this capture of data of what a, an apple is to you. Say I give the headset to Micah. He puts it on, looks at the same apple, we record his brainwave state. Okay, so they should, in theory, be quite similar. We don't know for sure at this point if they are, but presumably there will be an amount of machine learning and pattern recognition that we can feed these data sets into to arrive at what is the perception of an apple. It's kind of, I kind of liken it to the, the old days of, um, of um, Dragon Naturally Speaking, remember that app where you had to like train the, you had to train the the interface to recognize your voice. Yeah, Dragon Naturally Speaking led to Siri. Yeah, it's now Siri. Now you can pick up any phone and talk to it, and it knows your voice. You don't have to train it. It's not it's not a thing anymore. Like I say, the sort of the first step is gathering up these patterns, building up a large database of brainwave patterns, applying it to genetic algorithms and other machine learning techniques that will, in effect, be able to record what our perception is of certain objects. So that you could put it on another person and they can think Apple and you will know that it's Apple. It's kind of like this this read-only extracting of data from the brain. So step one is to do the facial recognition stuff. Step two is to do the pattern recognition for known objects. Step, I mean, uh, step three, of kind of a larger overriding step that we can be working on simultaneously is how do we do a write into the brain? So we're working on read. Write is another thing that's really far out on the horizon. But for now, I'd just be happy with read. But, you know... Presumably, if we know exactly what the pattern, the brainwave pattern is, is of you viewing an apple looks like, and we knew how to transmit that wave brainwave pattern into your brain, you would visualize an apple without there being an actual apple there. That's kind of the long and short of neural lace, I think. It's fascinating. Um, there's um, a, a lot of different people with a lot of different ideas about uh, new uh, ways to send data into the brain. Uh, for example, David Eagleman. Uh, talks about um, there are strips that you can put like on your tongue or on your back that um, the strip is a grid of electrodes and it's connected to a camera and the camera is watching uh, the world and takes that image and it converts it into uh, the electrical grid of, 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 um, of signals on your back or on your tongue and eventually your brain figures out um, how to see an image from that. So that is, is a way of, of inputting data back into the brain. In fact, just using your regular eyes is actually putting data back into your brain. So that's, that's another input channel to, to think about. Um, really fascinated with, um, you know, with all the different, um, ways. What, what Shannon, uh, shared is, is one way of, of tackling the problem of solving neural lace. But there's, there are people who are, um, studying medical imaging, um, you know, with, with MRI machines. Uh, besides EEG, so Shannon was like, well, let's, let's go the EEG approach. And there are people who um, are putting chips inside, uh, they're cutting into the brain and putting chips inside the, the, the patients of who have um, epilepsy who need their brains opened up anyways. Um, and then, so th- this has been sort of like a, a long dream of, 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 of scientists who study the brain of what kinds of sensors can we attach? And once we have the sensor data, how can we analyze that data? Um, with, uh, with with new uh, techniques like um, deep learning, with computer vision, we have we can create you know different kinds of biosensors. We can apply deep learning to these um, 
uh, sets of data in new ways and potentially revolutionize medical neuroscience by combining uh, state-of-the-art AI with uh, medical imaging of all kinds, not just EEG. But uh, So that's my thought there. Um, we can totally uh, start with some EEG products and and come up with, and the result of that action will will certainly yield some really awesome new neurolace products. But that's not the that's not necessarily the only um, direction the industry can go. Um, so that's de- it's definitely a, a broad topic, and I hope we can cover a lot of those different ways in this podcast. Yeah, I mean, certainly a wet interface is more efficient. I mean, you know, drill a hole in the back of someone's skull, mount an electrode. You know, it's in a known location. You can. You can uh, calibrate it and train it to, to know, you know, based on the exact brain, and it, it never shifts, it never moves, you know. But will will society adapt that? Adopt that? I I don't know. Jury's out on that one. I, I think not. But you know, I I'd, I'd probably be willing to try it, but I don't know that other people would. Um, so. I just wanted to say that um, I, I'm really interested in creating a, 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 a sort of um, installed um, uh, wetware um, sensor for the purpose of just research. But I, I, I was at CES 2017 and I saw this um, really awesome new uh, wireless uh, EEG system. So that's one of the things that um, companies are talking about right now is you know, we actually could do sort of a non-invasive um, neural lace that gets at the core of our brain by using a variety of, of um, tools, such as, um, you know, like like they use um, ultrasonic um, sound for surgery now. So there are ways to stimulate the brain and read the brain like really deep uh, without actually cutting into the brain. And so that's definitely an interesting topic. Well, I mean, it's certainly possible to embed an electrode under the skin. So let's say you, you have a sl- tiny incision behind the scalp, and you just insert the electrode under the, so it's directly on the skull. So that's, you know, quote-unquote wetware, but it's, it's not exactly as invasive as, you know, punching a hole in, the <laughs> in your skull. I don't know how pleasant that'd be. that would be. I, I think the, the, at least my goal for a manifestation of, a, of, a, of a, the version one of neural lace using EEG is it's going to look like a baseball cap. It's a baseball cap you pop on and it's got all the EEGs uh, sensors in there. Yes, there's going to be a ton of noise that comes out of those readings. Yes, it's going to be difficult to sort of sift out the meaning from all that data. But I, I think we've, we've been making a lot of uh, improvements and uh, advances in, um, in computer vision lately uh, with the, the autonomous driving vehicles and whatnot. And the LiDAR data that comes out of that is just so full of noise. It's, it's incredible how much noise is in that data. But, you know, our guys with doctorates and things have been working out great algorithms to sift through that data and pull out the meaning. So I think some of that learning, some of those learnings can be applied to EEG neural lays. Uh, definitely, um, you know, if you look at the uh, supercomputer that NVIDIA is doing for self-driving cars, that's a really mean and serious machine, and they're still figuring out how to do it. So basically, their computer has all these sensors, LiDAR, like I was just mentioned, uh, eight cameras besides that, and a whole bunch of other things. And it's figuring out not only the spaces around the car, but also it's 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 figuring out what the objects are. Like there is a, it's, it's saying, well, this is this is a, a cat, and this is a dog, and this is a car door, and this door is this car door is going to open, or this car door is going to close. And there's a car across the street that's, that's moving at such a speed, and, and it's going to intersect the path in front of you. These are things that they're having uh, that require a supercomputer that's going to be installed in the trunk of your car for, for, for driving. But if we could take, for one minute, if we could take those self-driving cars and apply them to the task of, of neuroscience, we could probably create a revolution in neuroscience. Um, so those are the kinds of things that, that uh, keep me up late. <laughs> Yeah, I've have seen uh, samples. I was I was at a talk recently at Stanford, and uh, they it was on it was on lidar, uh, single photon lidar stuff, and an image that it that it pulls out was just literally a cloud of looked like a cloud of dust. It was just like smeared. You couldn't make anything out of it, and then they did a single pass filter of it using their advanced algorithms, and. Voila! Embedded in that was you know a picture of a dog or whatever it was. I forget what the three, but a three-dimensional picture of this thing. But on the first pass of it, it just looked like garbage. 
That's what I anticipate the version one of Alpha of uh, Neural Lace using EEG will just have this cloud of garbage that comes out that we need to sift through to have you know true meaning of. So it's it's doable. I think it's doable. I think we just don't want to overthink it too much. Uh, so some final thoughts um, in terms of uh, you know recently in the news. Um, uh, e e we had uh, Elon Musk announced that he has a new Neuralink initiative, and yeah. so suddenly uh, Neuralink is a popular topic again. Um, <laughs> so, but b big companies that are are thinking about um, jumping into the Neuralink game, they what are some things that that uh, that they might need to think about in terms of you know making products that have that can scale and have broad commercial value? And uh, do you have uh, some some thoughts on that? Well, well, at this at this phase, we're we're such early days. I mean, we're just thinking about figuring out how to do it, um, you know, and if it can be done. Then we have to worry about you know ethics and uh, and uh, you know appealing to a broad range of people, not offending people, not letting them think we're using their their uh, thoughts to market things like that. I mean, so so ultimately, there will need to come into play some kind of standards. Um, I'm actually involved with the Kronos Group, uh, doing some stuff with OpenXR, uh, happens to do with VR and AR, and uh, also the IEEE. There's uh, some standards um, dealing with virtual reality, augmented reality. Yeah, so in particular, with augmented reality, let's say you have eye tracking, and you can see where people are looking. You can see if they look at the Coke can versus the, the Pepsi can. Now, do we allow that data to be transmitted to marketers? Uh, with personally identifiable information so that we know, you know, to always put a Coke ad in front of Shannon? You know, probably not. So we're, we'll, we'll need to develop standards having to do with brain-to-computer interface. So do we, do we let personally identifiable information be sent with uh, thought patterns to servers to be processed? No, definitely not. So we'll need to implement standards.